On the 26th of July 1944, representatives of the United States Joint Chiefs of Staff, key military leaders in the Pacific Theater, and President Franklin D. Roosevelt convened a conference to determine America's next steps in the war against the Empire of Japan. General Douglas MacArthur, commander of the Southwest Pacific Area, vigorously argued that the main objective should be reconquering the Philippines, while many members of the Navy favored invading the island of Formosa including the Commander-in-Chief of the US Naval Fleet, Admiral Ernest King. King and his supporters believed that Formosa would be a valuable target because it would allow the United States to better support the Chinese nationalists against the Japanese. Ultimately, MacArthur prevailed and the conference moved on to the topic of the volcano islands in the Central Pacific. One island in particular was of keen interest to the conference, Iwo Jima, on the 3rd of October 1944, Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Theatre Admiral Chester Nimitz was directed by the Joint Chiefs of Staff to execute Operation Detachment, the invasion of Iwo Jima. Five months later, three divisions of Marines would storm the island and find themselves locked in one of the bloodiest battles of the Second World War. However, the events which led to the Battle of Iwo Jima had been set in motion much earlier as both sides gradually adjusted their strategic goals eventually setting the stage for the bloodshed to follow. The road to Iwo Jima began in June 1942 after the decisive American naval victory at Midway. Following the stunning destruction of most of Japan's available naval air power, American High Command believed its forces were ready to conduct offensive operations after taking a defensive stance for the first months of the war. The Allies decided to strike in the Solomon Islands after receiving reports that the Japanese were building an airfield on the island of Guadalcanal. On the 7th of August 1942, American Marines supported by British and Commonwealth forces landed on Guadalcanal and seized the airfield. Although caught by surprise, the Japanese reacted swiftly and dispatched much of its military resources to the area. Over the next six months, the campaign turned into a battle of attrition on both land and at sea as the Japanese and the Allies poured men and material into the fight. Yet, the Allies were better equipped to sustain their losses, and by February of 1943, the Japanese had been driven off the island. It was the Allies' first major land victory in the Pacific Theater, and one which firmly wrestled the initiative away from the Japanese. Following the victory at Guadalcanal, the Americans decided upon the island hopping campaign to prosecute the war against Japan. General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz, along with Admiral Bull Halsey, agreed that rather than direct assaults on the Japanese home islands, the Allies would pick and choose which enemy-held territories to attack. The islands which were deemed too heavily defended and of lesser strategic importance would be subjected to bombardment while their supply lines would be cut, a practice MacArthur referred to as withering on the vine. Eventually, the hope was that these larger Japanese bases would fall without a fight as the enemy troops faced an extended siege. MacArthur's forces would advance from the south through the Solomon Islands, New Guinea and the Bismarck Islands towards the Philippines, while Nimitz would strike the Central Pacific aiming for the volcanic island chain. With the industrial might of the United States supplying endless amounts of war material, time would be on the side of the Allies as they methodically advanced across the Pacific. The situation was far more dire for the Japanese following Midway and Guadalcanal. The most important result of these battles was the steep decline in the Imperial Navy's operational reach and capability. Hundreds of trained airmen had been lost in addition to dozens of warships and transports. To make matters worse, Admiral Yamamoto, Japan's finest naval officer and commander of the Imperial Navy, was killed when his aircraft was ambushed by American fighters in April of 1943. The new leader of the Imperial Navy, Admiral Koga, originally planned on undertaking an offensive to draw the American fleet into a decisive battle where it could be destroyed. However, he quickly discovered that Japanese naval aviation was in no shape to carry out an attack on such a scale until it could be rebuilt and its losses replaced. Instead, Japan's remaining naval power would be carefully preserved until the time was right to strike a decisive blow. Koga's strategy in the meantime would be to establish a defensive perimeter on the islands Japan currently occupied and inflict as many casualties on the Allies as possible. When they had penetrated to what Koga referred to as the inner defensive line, 
stretching from the Marianas Islands to the Philippines, he would launch his naval counterattack. The post-Guadalcanal island hopping began on the 20th of November 1943, when Nimitz's forces invaded the Gilbert Islands. The most important target was the tiny atoll of Tarawa, where the Japanese had constructed an airfield and had a garrison of less than 5,000 men. Despite overwhelming superiority in numbers, air and naval power, the Americans suffered appalling casualties storming the island as the 2nd Marine Division struggled against the entrenched enemy. Tarawa only fell after four days of brutal fighting in which the Marines took over 3,000 casualties. The Japanese on the atoll fought nearly to the death. Only 17 of the nearly 5,000 men in the garrison survived to be taken prisoner. The surprisingly tough battle had a profound impact on Lieutenant General Holland Smith, who examined the enemy fortifications and discovered that the pre-invasion barrage had not been heavy enough. Smith would later command the invasion of Iwo Jima, but his insistence on a massive and long bombardment of the island would be ignored. After similarly heavy losses on the Makin Atoll, Nimitz moved on to the Marshall Islands. After American codebreakers intercepted messages from Admiral Koga ordering the reinforcement of several of the Marshall Islands, Nimitz decided to bypass them and instead struck the islands where the enemy was weakest. In contrast to the difficult Gilbert Islands campaign, the Marines suffered only 611 killed in capturing their objectives, while the Japanese suffered 12,000 casualties. The more heavily defended islands were isolated and left to wither on the vine, showing that the Americans were learning the lessons in conducting island hopping. Meanwhile, MacArthur's land forces prepared to launch Operation Cartwheel to neutralise the major Japanese base at Rabaul. Beginning in late June of 1943, the Allies carried out 11 operations to capture enemy-held territories in New Guinea, New Georgia and Bougainville to sever the communications to Rabaul. As the islands around Rabaul began to fall one by one, the Japanese attempted to greatly reinforce the base with carrier aircraft in December of 1943. The following weeks saw massive aerial battles in the skies above the South Pacific, which resulted in massive losses for Japanese naval aviators. By late February 1944, Operation Cartwheel had concluded, and Rabaul had been rendered useless to the enemy without the need for a land invasion. One relatively small battle during the New Guinea campaign would prove to be ominous for things to come. On the 27th of May 1944, two infantry divisions of the US Army landed on the island of Biak to establish a base to support the drive towards the Philippines. Usually, the Japanese would resist the initial landings, concentrating most of their men and firepower on the invasion beaches. Once the Americans were ashore, they would face mass banzai charges which would usually result in heavy casualties for the enemy with little success. On Biak, however, Colonel Kazume Naoyuki instead built a fortified defence in depth, allowing the Americans to land unopposed before drawing them into an attritional close quarters battle. US operational planners had predicted the campaign would take a week, but the final Japanese defenders on Biak were not destroyed until almost three months later, after causing almost 3,000 US casualties. The next objective would be clearing the Marianas Islands, the gateway to the Central Pacific. The capture of the Marianas would place the home islands of Japan within American B-29 Superfortress bombing range. As part of Operation Forager, 5th Amphibious Corps hit the beaches of Saipan, where the Japanese had chosen to make their main stand on the 15th of June 1944. The Marine amphibious landing craft came under heavy fire on their way to the beaches, but were able to establish a foothold on the island and held off multiple counter-attacks throughout the first two days. The Japanese recognised the danger of losing the Marianas and resolved to defend the islands at all costs. After the death of Admiral Koga in a plane crash, new commander of the combined fleet, Fleet Admiral Toyoda decided that now was the time to seek a decisive carrier battle with the US Navy. Toyoda's fleet sailed out with Imperial Japan's remaining aircraft carriers and naval aviation. However, the Americans had learned of Japanese intentions and were ready. The resulting Battle of the Philippine Sea was an unmitigated disaster for the Japanese, who lost almost 700 aircraft and three carriers in the one-sided engagement. Although most of the Imperial Japanese fleet escaped intact, its naval aviation arm has been essentially wiped out. In 
After the American victory at sea, the Japanese on Saipan were left without supply and were eventually forced into small pockets on the northern and western shores of the island. At dawn on the 7th of July, the remaining Japanese defenders launched the largest Banzai charge of the war. Over 4,000 men surged forward in a desperate attempt to overwhelm the American front lines, but almost all perished in the face of heavy machine gun and artillery fire. With the main Japanese garrison in the Marianas subdued, the islands of Guam and Tinian were invaded and occupied by mid-August. The United States could now launch a strategic bombing campaign against the Japanese home islands, changing the calculus of the war. It is at this time that the Pacific Conference was convened in Hawaii and MacArthur's plan to assault the Philippines was chosen as the next course of action. At the same time as the Pacific Conference, Japanese High Command were also debating their next move. When MacArthur's forces landed on the island of Leyte on the 20th of October, Admiral Toyoda and the Imperial General Staff set in motion their plan to defend the Philippines with the last of the Japanese Navy. The subsequent battle of Leyte Gulf from the 23rd to the 26th of October was one of the largest naval engagements in history and although both sides took heavy losses, Japanese naval power was finally extinguished once and for all. Ominously, it was the first battle where the Japanese employed kamikazes in large numbers. While the battle for the Philippines raged, MacArthur argued that Palau on the western end of the Caroline Islands needed to be captured in order to protect his left flank during the invasion of the Philippines. There was a Japanese airfield on the small coral island of Peleliu, which both Nimitz and MacArthur believed needed to be neutralised. The commander of the invasion, Major General William Rupertus, believed the island would be taken after four days. On the 15th of September 1944, the 1st Marine Division landed on the island and were immediately drawn into what would later be called the bitterest battle of the war for the Marines. In contrast to the defence of Saipan, Colonel Nakagawa had learned the lessons from the Biak campaign and constructed an elaborate defence on Peleliu's difficult terrain. The Marines were forced to clear the defenders out of miles of tunnels impervious to shelling. It would take nearly three months and almost 50% casualties for the Marines, with reinforcements from the 81st Infantry Division, to secure the island. Although Peleliu was a strategically insignificant battle, its impacts would have immense consequences for later campaigns. It proved that Japan's new defence-in-depth system could cause massive casualties for the numerically and technologically superior American forces. Lieutenant General Tadamichi Kuribayashi would emulate Nakagawa's defensive strategy on Iwo Jima four months later. The Allies eventually overcame major Japanese resistance in the Philippines by early 1945, setting the stage for the invasion of Iwo Jima. Since the disastrous campaigns at Midway and Guadalcanal, Japan had changed its military strategy to reflect the inevitability of its defeat. Rather than attempting audacious offensive operations, Japanese commanders decided to emphasise battles of attrition in order to grind down Allied men and material. This was done in the hope that inflicting enough casualties on the enemy would result in better terms once Japan was forced to negotiate an end to the war. For the United States, the objective would be winning the war with as few casualties as possible. The battle for Iwo Jima would show that this would be no easy task. Over on our sister channel, The Operations Room, we're covering the entire Iwo Jima campaign in a four-part series of battle animations. Head over there to see the play-by-play -play of the battle. If not, we'll see you in the next Intel report.